All right. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thanks to uh, Alex, Andra, and, and the crew for all the efforts to organize this event. What I want to do here for the next about uh, 40 plus minutes is uh, talk a little bit about the trend we are seeing in Java, where we are heading, and, and, and also more important, why we are heading there, I think is really important for us to understand as well. Uh, so I, I titled this as uh, Where uh, Promises Fall uh, Short, and I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by, first of all, promises, and then why it is uh, falling short. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those things along the way as well. But, but my focus really here today is uh, to focus on multi-threading, focus on uh, concurrency, just uh, 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 one aspect of where we use Java in various different ways uh, in our um, uh, uh, applications and, and how this has an impact on what we do. Uh, so one of the things, I, I started programming about uh, 35 years ago, and uh, uh, a lot of my earlier work uh, commercial and uh, in uh, teaching as well was to use C++. And, and if you have ever used a C++, or C for that matter, we often hear about portability and portable applications. But as it turns out, uh, back in time, not today, but you know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, these languages, uh, libraries, were really not as portable as we claim them to be. For example, back in C and C++, there was no single concurrency library. If you wrote your program for a Unix operating system versus, let's say, a Windows, you had to really use different libraries. I was amazed when Java came out because Java gave us this one library where you can just write code once and run it in any operating system in which Java was being supported. So I remember uh, you know, looking at Java 1.0. Uh, this is 28 years ago. Uh, some of you probably were not born at the time. Some of you probably were in diapers. Uh, some of us were teenagers and so on, right? I was none of them. I was much older at the time, but nevertheless, I was really excited to see Java 1.0 really have a concurrency library as part of it. But of course, uh, I want to talk about uh, parallel and concurrent programming just for a minute. This is a confusion for a lot of us, me included, and we often ask the question, you know, what does it really mean to be parallel? What does it mean to be concurrent? Uh, so I'm going to, you know, think a little bit about it, and I apologize for the person in the camera. I'm going to walk away a little bit, but I promise to come back in just a minute. I have this ability to walk and speak at the same time. I don't have If you were to consider a unit of time, in, in that time, as time progresses, I can walk and speak at the same time. But if you take one instance of time, at that very instance, I am actually taking steps and speaking words exactly at the same moment. On the same token, if you take a period of time, let's say take an hour, maybe in that hour I want to say a number of words, but I also maybe want to empty the glass of water. So in that hour, I would have spoken, I would have drank my water as well, but any given time, either I'm drinking water or I'm saying words, not both at the same time. So concurrency and parallel, in both cases, multiple task progress at the same, or during the duration of time. But but one is executed and not the other in the case of concurrency at a time instance, like drinking water and saying words, versus both can run in the, uh, simultaneously, like walking and speaking, if you will. Now, having talked about these two, we then can settle down to talk about synchronous versus asynchronous communication. So what does synchronous mean? What does asynchronous really mean? Well, synchronous simply is a blocking call, but asynchronous really is a non-blocking call. But of course, the question is, what in the world does non-blocking really mean? Well, if you are making a call to a database, or you're making a call to a remote file system, or you're trying to make a call to a web service, 
It's obvious that you cannot do anything more until you get the response back. So you always have to block to get the response back and going. So then in that case, what does non-blocking mean? So the non-blocking really is referring to the thread of execution, not the task of execution. Your task will always have to block on getting the results back. If I want to know, if I want to perform a, you know, a sale or not, based on the amount of money I have, and I query for the amount of money I have, I cannot do the sale until I know how much money I have. So I have to block on the task to move forward. But the threat of execution, I don't need to be blocking. So let's dive into that a little bit more and talk about it. In Java, we've been doing multi-threading for a very long time, 28 years actually. So the good news is we've been doing multi-threading for a long time. However, what does it mean to really write multi-threaded code? Almost everyone in this room, I am sure, who has ever written a program has written a program for single-threaded applications. We learn to write single-threaded code to begin with. Now, how do you know you're writing a single-threaded application? I'll tell you how you know. If you're writing a single-threaded application, when you go to work, your colleagues will actually smile at you. That's the way you know you're writing a single-threaded application. They are nice to you, you go to lunch together as a team, you even go home in the evening. That's how you know you're writing multi-threaded application. And then as, uh, uh, sorry, single-threaded application. And you write this for a while, and then one day somebody says, gosh, the performance is not great, we need to use multi-threading. And so you start throwing some threads Threads. And after you throw some threads together, you throw some locks together. And then you put a brief synchronized blocks around. And then, of course, what happens? The code turns into a monster, isn't it? You cannot even recognize the code anymore. And as you're writing the code, you think about, back in time, the code was so beautiful, now I cannot even recognize it. And then what happens? It doesn't work properly. And then you spend late night debugging the code. And the day they introduce multi-threading is the last day there was joy at work and everybody is grumpy and late in the night you're debugging the code and in the middle of debugging you apply for the other job that's called concurrency right now that's not fun obviously but that's the way that was in Java so essentially let's talk about some lessons we can learn from this so in the past and and a lot of us who have written code in Java before the time of Java 8 and even after to a great extent, very clearly remember this, right? So in the past, you could say the structure of, you could say imperative style, uh, a sequential code was very different, you could say, from the structure of, in this case, imperative style again, uh, a parallel uh, code. So we all remember this. So for example, if you were to take, let's say, a list of numbers, let's say numbers is equal to, let's say a list of, oh, let's say a list of numbers one to 10, let's start with this collection of numbers. And if you wanted to say for, well, actually, let's say result is equal to zero, and you say for, let's say, element coming from the numbers collection, and I want to say if the element mod two is equal to zero, then I want to say result is plus equal to elements time two, and then I want to output the result, let's say. So this is an imperative style code that is going to total through, in this particular case, the values that we have in this particular collection that we are going to bring in uh, and use it in here. So when you look at this particular code, the result is 60. So that was not too really hard to write, isn't it? So as we know, this is an imperative style. But someone says, let us make this multi-threaded. Now, if uh, that's right, I heard you, right? That's the right response. You only have two options at this point, either to laugh or to cry. And I am happy you choose to laugh. I love it, right? That's exactly the point. And, and the people here are in defiance. They're like, oh my goodness, right? They're telling their prayers at this point. Yeah, that's not fun because that code is gonna turn into a monster if you try to make this multi-threaded. That is the life we live. The structure of imperative style sequential code is very different from the structure of imperative style 
parallel code. That's a disaster in the making. We never uh, enjoy that. So what can we do to solve this particular problem? Well, here's an idea. We can go back to this code and say, hey, here's a way we can accomplish this. We, after all, want the double of all the even numbers in this collection. So I want to output the result when I am done. But a result in this particular case is equal to numbers.stream, and we can do a filter and in this case, we can say, given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0, map the element to a maybe a integer, and given an element, element times 2, and you can perform the sum operation on it, and the result is exactly the same, but as we know, that's a functional pipeline. But the beauty is this. Not only is the code easier to understand, easier to work with, easier to modify, pleasant to write the code, but also it's extremely easy to parallelize it. If you want to run this code in parallel, as you can see here, the result is 60, but you can say parallel stream uh, in here, and now the code is running in parallel to produce the result for you. So going from a sequential to a parallel is extremely simple. But what is really cool about this is the structure of the code is exactly the same as it was with sequential and parallel. So we could say, you know, from Java 8, you could say the structure of functional style, you could say a sequential a code is the same as the structure of, you could say, functional style parallel code. And of course, this is going to be uh, thanks to uh, Java uh, Streams API. So this was one of the aha moments for a lot of us in Java 8, because you can make the code expressive. You can you know, verify it's working. If the performance is adequate, just leave it like that. But if you really want to improve the performance, you can make it a parallel stream with almost no effort. And, and that is incredible incredibly better because we don't have to spend a lot of time and effort to improve the performance. Just a very small, negligible, trivial amount of effort later, you got performance in that code by running it parallel. So that's pretty awesome. But the question you want to ask is, you know, that's great. We saw the power of streams. That's parallel. But what about asynchronous programming? Well, if we're going to be a doing asynchronous programming, that is really non-blocking. Let's understand what non-blocking really means in that particular context. Now, let's think about this for a second to understand what would non-blocking really mean with a, re with a you know, little analogy, if you will. Let's agree on one thing. The very first order of business that everybody does when we go to work is to get that cup of coffee, isn't it? You go into work and you gotta fill your cup of coffee before you do anything. So you walk up to the coffee machine and on that morning, uh, you realize the coffee machine is empty, coffee pot is empty. And we're not really happy when we see the coffee pot empty, so what do you do? You start brewing some coffee. But I hope this is not what you do. You turn on the coffee machine and you just stand there staring at the coffee pot dripping coffee. Your colleagues come to you and say, are you okay? Don't respond to them. Just keep staring and don't move. And they're like, are you okay? You should, you should we call for help? Don't move because the coffee is not ready. That is called a blocking call. You are waiting on the coffee before you even move. I hope that's not how you behave, right? So what do you do? You turn on the coffee machine and you say, this machine doesn't have coffee, but I'm gonna know, I'm gonna have a fresh cup of coffee. That's the motivation when it's ready. And you go to your colleague and say, hey, I'm ready to talk about the design. And your colleague says, oh, I need about 10 minutes before I'm ready. You're like, fine, let me know when you're ready. And you go turn this email server on. It's taking time to download that large email. Now you're looking at your design documentation. If I come to you and say, what are you doing? You non-blocking you. You are waiting for the coffee to brew, your colleague to be ready for the design meeting, waiting for the email to be downloaded while you're reviewing the design document. That is you non-blocking. You didn't block on any of the tasks. 
you have you had your coffee? No. The minute the coffee pot is ready, you're going to have coffee, but you're not blocking and waiting on it. So in the past, how did Java work? And when I say in the past, like yesterday, right? So how does Java actually work? Unfortunately, when you create a single-threaded application, in the single-threaded application, you make a call to a remote server, or you are making an update to a database, or you're performing a long computation. What's going to happen at this point? Your task is running, and your thread is running with it. You make a database call, or you make a remote web service call, and your call says, I need some time to respond. And the thread says, don't worry about it. I'm right here with you. And the thread is waiting and blocking with the task. Now you say, oh my gosh, the thread is stuck. That's really not good. We don't get good performance. What should we do? Because threads are so poor, we'll create more of it. Think of that logic, right? So we have been creating more threads because threads really don't behave really well. They get stuck. So the fundamental problem is, poor utilization of a resource, which is the threads. So sure, threads are lightweight, but guess what threads do? They literally get stuck when a task is stuck. What you really want is the following. Your task is executing, your thread is running that particular task, and your task says, oh, I'm going to make a remote call. I need a little bit of time to respond to you. And the thread says, no worries, you take care of it, I'll be right back. And you want the thread to go away, and you want it to come back. This is basically what asynchronous communication really is. So asynchronous versus synchronous is your thread doesn't block and wait on your execution. Instead, your thread says, I'm going to be going and serving other requests in the meantime while the task is executing. So this is exactly what you want to do with this asynchronous communication. How do we do this really in Java? in the past, uh, uh, at least in the near past, how did we really do it? So this is where a concept has been in Java, but a lot of people really haven't as much experienced with it as you would expect. So if I ever asked a bunch of Java programmers, what is the coolest thing in Java 8, what do we normally say? The first thing that comes out of our mouth is lambda expressions, right? Because Java 8 gave us lambdas. Maybe the second thing that comes out of our mouth is a streams API. But there is one other very interesting feature, and that was that had some promises, let me say. So from Java 8, the structure of functional style, uh, you know, I'm going to say a synchronous code, notice I changed the word sequential to synchronous, is, is the same as the structure of a functional style, I'm going to say async asynchronous uh, code, uh, uh, you know, code and thanks to. Anyone wants to take a try? What is that? Bingo, completable future. That's exactly what it is. So a completable uh, future. Now, the beauty of this is completable future was introduced in Java 8 exactly the same time as the Streams API was introduced. Just for the curiosity's sake, I wrote an entire book on Java 8, and you know how many times I mentioned the word completable future in it? Zero times. And I was shocked at the amount of exposure this really has not had. So out of curiosity, how many of you have ever used the Stream API? Just a show of hands, right? Okay, keep your hand up. If you have also used completable future, keep it up, otherwise put it down, right? So notice a few hands go up, right? So this is the, thank you. And this is the problem is, we have used one, but not as much the other. But, but why? Well, let's come back to this in a minute. Now let's step back to one other thing we want to talk about before we go any further. And, and I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this thing called JavaScript. Okay, I, I, I know, I know, that's okay. We, we are among friends, it's okay. Um, it's important to learn from anything in the world. 
even including evil things. We should learn from them. It's okay. But if you think about JavaScript, JavaScript used to have what are called callbacks. Now, callbacks in JavaScript where you call a function, but you send a function reference to that function, which it'll call back. Now, at first thought, it seems like a great idea. And you say, whoa, that's interesting. You can call a function, you can send a callback. The function runs, when it's done, it calls the callback function. But then the question is, what if the callback needs a callback which needs a callback? And what if we have to deal with errors and exceptions? If you ever think callbacks are an interesting idea, I have a recommendation for you. Find a friend who programs in JavaScript all the time and sit down next to them, just surprisingly, suddenly say the word callback. And within a second, you will begin to notice they begin to cry unconsolably because that's how much pain they've been in using callback. So JavaScript introduced a concept of promises. So promises really are, you know, some kind of an asynchronous future, that's what it really is. So promises were introduced in JavaScript, and you can use promises to make asynchronous calls, and rather than having callbacks, you chain the next call to a promise. So you basically take a promise, a function is going to return, and then you say then, and these are called thenable, and then you can also do a catch to handle an exception as well, and so on. So I came across this concept of promises in JavaScript. I've been using this for a few years in my JavaScript code. And then when I came across this concept of completable future, I was amazed to say, whoa, what in the world that is? And then when I started using completable fu uh, uh, futures, I came to a very grim realization. And that is Java's completable uh, future is the same as JavaScript's, if you will, uh, uh, promises. So essentially, uh, this is exactly the same. I really wish the folks who wrote the API in Java called it promises. I would have learned it in 10 seconds and I would have been done with it. After digging so much, it was a realization, oh my goodness, it's the same damn thing that they wrote in JavaScript as promises promises is completed future in Java. So now you know why I call it as promises. But I'm going to say promises fall short. Why do promises actually fall short? So let's talk about that a little bit with a little example in here. So let's say for a minute, I want to create an asynchronous call. So we'll say a concurrent dot star right in here. And I want to create a completable, let's say, a future dot supply async. And this is going to, let's keep it extremely trivial. I'm going to call a function called compute uh, right in here. So let's start with that little code right now. So what does the compute function really do? So the compute function is going to return a value. It doesn't take any arguments right there. So I'm going to simply return a value of two, let's say. However, I'm going to say, in this case, a thread, let's say in compute, let's say in compute, and I'm going to say over here, let's say a thread dot current thread. So we can see what thread we are currently executing in. So once I call the compute, I say then, well, given a data, I want to transform the data. So we'll call a transform function, and we'll come to that in just a minute. And I'm going to then say, so this is then, but this is Java and not JavaScript. So you say then apply, and that is to say we want to perform a transformation. This is another complaint I have. When I started looking at then apply, I was puzzled. What in the world then apply is? Well, let's think about the streams API for a minute. In the streams API, you take a stream, you call a map function, and you can take a data and you can do some transformation of data. Now to the map function, you pass this lambda expression. Anyone remembers what's the functional interface for that lambda expression? Bingo, function, thank you. Do you remember the abstract method name in the function? Apply, it's called apply. So map is taking a function. Now you know why this is called apply. 
That's because if they called it map, you would have understood what it was. So they said, let's come up with a different name. So this is nothing but the math function. That's what it really is. So the then apply is a math function. And I really wish they called it math because that would like, duh, of course, that's what we are doing. We are transforming the data. But essentially, we are applying that particular function in this particular case. And then I say, in this case, then accept. And you know why it's called then accept? Because it takes a consumer, and consumer's abstract method is accept method. They could have called it for each, but again, this is a one data, not a series of data, so they called it then up accept. So in this case, I'm gonna say system dot out, and I wanna print it, and I say print line, and I'm gonna print it. So given this, of course, what's a transform function? So we can say in this case, let's say int transform, which uh, takes a integer, we'll say number, and all I'm gonna do is simply return, let's say, a number times two for, for a minute. It. So when you look at this particular code, we are calling this function, we are creating a data asynchronously. Now the compute method, imagine rather than returning a two, goes out to a remote service and gets a data from maybe a bank server and finds a balance or whatever that could be. Then we transform the data and then we want to print the data out right in here in this particular case. So given this particular code, I'm gonna simply say over here, let's say a try thread dot sleep just for a minute. Be, uh, and then I'm gonna say, uh, oh, maybe a two second delay, if you will. Let's say a catch exception for a second and, and run the code. So what does that tell us? So in this particular example, we have a result of two, which we double and then we print it. So when you look at the output, notice the call was done in a worker one and, and the result is a four, as you can see. However, what is important to keep in mind here is that this may run synchronously or it may run asynchronously. We are in the main thread. We didn't tell it to create a thread. We simply said supply async. And then we are calling the then apply right there. So where will the then apply actually run? Well, the question is, the answer is, it depends, or uh, it depends, right? So essentially in this case, when you output this, I'm gonna say, you know, in main, let's say for a minute. So in main, and I'm gonna then say, of course, a thread dot current thread and print it right here in main. As you would expect, the output shows main is running in the main thread. However, if I go back to the uh, transform method, and in the transform method I say in transform, and I want to know what thread that's running in, notice the transform is running in the worker one that's asynchronous as well. However, this can be a little bit tricky, if you will. So if I go back here and remove that comment uh, outline, uh, comment, comment line uh, that tells me that it's running the compute in the other thread, did you notice a surprise? The transform is running in the main thread. So the question is, was this synchronous or was this asynchronous? And the right answer is two things. It depends and I don't care. Right? So essentially, that is the beauty of the structure of synchronous versus asynchronous code. And again, to reiterate it, notice the transform is running in the main thread right now. However, if this task is taking a little longer to run, then you can see that transform is running in a different thread. The structure of synchronous code and asynchronous code is exactly the same. But even better, the system is very much adaptive to say, if you're running really fast, I won't waste my time, I'll be synchronous. If you're taking some time, I won't waste your time, I will run it asynchronous and non-blocking. The code is able to ad adapt itself to the flow at runtime. Isn't that awesome, isn't it? So the question is, if it is so great, why not just be happy with it? Well, unfortunately, as powerful as this solution is, as we can see, what if things were to go wrong? 
You are making an I.O. call. You are calling to a database. You are making a call to a remote server. You are making a call to maybe a web service, and something goes wrong. What do you do if something goes wrong? So let's go back to this code and say math.random, because things go fail in random, isn't it? Greater than 0.5, then I'm going to say throw new runtime, let's say, exception. Let's raise an exception very much similar to what we see in production. Oops something went wrong, right? We see this all the time. It's very helpful message, isn't it? Every time I see this, I cry. If something went wrong, how does that help me, right? But we'll follow the tradition. Oops, something went wrong. So this says, oops, something went wrong about half the time. Let's run the code really quickly. Let's not throw the exception just for a minute. Look at the output, it is a four, because two times two is four. But what if I throw the exception, what's going to happen? That's exactly what happened, right? So it doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us something actually failed. What's the reason for it? Because you didn't handle the exception, so it did not bother to do anything with the exception. And you say, oh my gosh, what do we do about it? But before I go further, I do have to give one credit. The people I complained earlier, they could have called it map and they called it then apply. But the people who wrote this API have a weird sense of humor. And they were very clever in naming this function. If something goes wrong and you want to deal with the exception, the method name is called exceptionally. So this is amazing, right? Because you're writing the code and you know you're writing exceptionally when things have gone terribly bad. But the boss comes to you and says, how's it going? You say, exceptionally, right? So your programmer colleagues will know, but your boss will not know what you're talking about, right? So exceptionally, what are you gonna do? You wanna handle the exception right now. So you say, sample handle exception. Now, this is where uh, you are going to find the rough edges out of this, unfortunately. Watch this very carefully, what is happening here. You are in a functional pipeline, and Java is a statically typed language. So what that means is, you got to have a very strict type matching throughout. Re remove this line for a minute. What is this returning? This is returning an integer. What is this accepting an integer? So if I were to add one more then apply to transform again, this time obviously you're gonna get a four times two eight as a result if there is no exception. That's what you want to see if there was no exception in this particular code. Again, if I remove the exception, result is eight as you can see. But with the exception, what is gonna happen? Well, now you have a type matching. So in this case, when this were to fail, what do you want to do? So you're gonna say over here, in this particular code, exceptionally, and you say sample handle exception. Now, if I were to write the public, let's say static, handle exception throwable, and the throwable, it says throwable. And what do I want to do in this throwable? I want to output the throwable, maybe tell you what the error was, but maybe I don't have anything else to do. Maybe it's end of life for this. What am I going to do? Well, here's the unfortunate event. Notice where I put the exceptionally. I want to handle the exception between here and here. So as a result, the return type of the handle exception needs to conform with what the transform is expecting. You're gonna kick and scream and cry when you do this. Because when you handle the exception, you gotta come back and say, oh, this has got to be an integer, and of course I'm going to return a null because I have nothing to return in this case. Or maybe return a recovered value if you have. 
But whatever it is, this is very unpleasant because you're gonna be sitting there and asking, how do I handle the exception really? And, and as you go through this particular code, you will notice that the exception is printed, but there's no more response at this point because the next call failed as well. But at the point is that this becomes extremely messy. This is why I say where promises fall short. So this is a nice idea but the problem is, it works great when everything is happy. But if there are unhappy paths, you become very unhappy writing the code because there is no really clear way to write the code. And especially if you have multiple levels of exception, the code becomes messier and messier and messier. So when it comes to asynchronous programming, it becomes really hard to write the code. But there's another problem, really, if you think about it. And the problem here is, in what we saw so far in, in our examples in here, notice, if you write the functional style code, the structure is the same. If you write the functional style code, the structure is the same. But if you write the imperative style code, what's the answer? Well, does it mean we should quit writing code in imperative style? But Unfortunately, though, one of the problems we need to deal with is the following. Functional style is awesome, uh, but so it reduces accidental complexity in code. The code is easier to read, easier to understand, easier to modify, but it does not deal with impurity uh, or exceptions uh, well. So it doesn't deal with impurity and exceptions well. So your functions have to be pure functions. If you want to perform a database transaction right in the middle of your functional pipeline, that's not gonna work really well. If you want to perform logging or write to a file, read from a file, talk to a remote web service, those things don't fit really well with functional style. And so what we need to do is, you know, whereas imperative style, uh, you know, a style, you could say is a style uh, is more complex, but deals uh, deals with uh, impurity, uh, impurity, uh, of course, uh, as the first thing, and exceptions really well. So we really need an answer for really imperative style of programming. So what's the answer? And here is finally, I would say the answer is, to understand this, let's take a look at an example of this just to get a feeling for this. So if I were to say a public static, let's say in this case, and I would say avoid get stuff, and that's gonna take an int index, but what I'm gonna do within this function is, let's say java.nio.file. And I'm gonna say a try, and I will say var length is equal to, let's say files.lines, in this case, paths.get, uh, uh, paths.get, let's go ahead and say in this case, uh, sample.java, the file we are in already, dot count, and let's get the length of it right there for a second. So once we get the length of that, let's go ahead and say output, we'll output the length right here but we'll also output the index plus, let's output the a thread, let's say a thread dot current thread, and we'll output that for a second. Then of course, that's a try block, and we will say catch, let's say exception, and in this case, I'm not gonna deal with the exception, but I will simply print out, let's say index, and I will say catch, and then the thread, and I will display it. So in this code one more time, when we enter it, I'll output the index as well. So we'll say enter. So when we do this, you can see I'm entering, printing the thread, calling the file, printing the thread, uh, and then in the catch, printing the thread. Let's try this one more time. I say max equal to 10, and we will say uh, a try a thread dot, let's say uh, sleep for about five seconds. Uh, and, and not even five seconds, let's say two seconds, and I'll say catch exception, we'll say EX, so just give it a little break in there. But I'm going to change this code to say a far int i equal to zero i less than, let's say max, and i plus plus, 
And one more uh, little code right here. Let's go ahead and say new thread, and we will call the get stuff function. So uh, pardon me, I'm going to say here is a get stuff, and I'll send an index to that particular function, and we'll start where the index is, let's say, equal to the value of i. So we are calling this function within this code and asking it to execute. Let's take a look at the thread of execution. They make the life really easy for us. If you notice, I want you to remember a few things. Seven is the index, the thread is seven. Six is the index, thread is six. One is the index, thread is one. That couldn't be easier, right? So it was a direct mapping. This is called sheer dumb luck. So in this case, if you notice seven, that's thread seven. If you notice one, that's thread one. If you notice six, that's thread six. What, is, what can we infer from this? What we infer from this is when you call the thread, the thread says, oh, you're going to take some time to do the work. I will wait for you. Now let's imagine this for a minute. Let's say you go to a restaurant and you're sitting at the restaurant table, the waiter comes to you and says, what would you like to drink? And you say, I'm not sure what I'm really interested in, what would you recommend? And the waiter says, well, here are the things we have, what is your, what's on your mind? And you say, I'm not still sure, I'm thinking. What, what is the worst waiter will do? The worst waiter says, let me grab a chair and sit next to you and start talking for the next five minutes. The restaurant will go out of business if they do that, right? What does the good waiter do? The good waiter says, why don't you think about those things I said, I'll be right back, and goes on to help other customers in other tables. What, what is the threat doing here? Threat is doing work like that really bad waiter. Because the function says, let me go call the file and get the data. And the thread is like, don't worry, I'm waiting here for you, right? It drags a chair, sits next to you. Or if you want to look at another example, those of us who are parents know this. If uh, you have a little child, a toddler, and the child says, I want to sleep, you don't say, that's a great idea, let's sleep, and you don't sleep with the child, right? That's when you actually get your work done. So you make the child sleep, and you go off and do other work, that's called efficiency. So in this example, the thread was rather very inefficient. What do you do when a thread is inefficient? You create more threads. Is that a good idea? It's extremely good for the cloud providers because now they are like, keep going. You need servers, you need clusters, and now we are sending big checks to them, and they are like, this is awesome. Send your guys, we'll play golf with them, and we are very happy, right? But the problem is, it affects your bottom line. We are screwing the environment because we need clusters of machine, why? Because threads are not efficient. What we need is better threads. And Java now has what are called super lightweight threads. You say, whoa, wait a minute. Why do you use the word super lightweight? Because the word lightweight was taken. So they had to use super lightweight. So threads are lightweight. Virtual threads are super lightweight. So notice what I'm going to do here. I am changing one line of code, exactly one line of code, right? I commented that code out. I didn't change anything in the top where I'm performing the file I.O. I'm not doing that. Instead, I say a thread dot, and in this case, I'm going to simply say a thread dot start virtual thread. That's all I did. Change a thread to a virtual thread, that's all I did. What's the difference now? If you notice now though, notice thread task index seven is run by worker eight. Remember that seven and eight. Look at five, five and six, just as an example, right? So five to six and seven to eight. Let's go back here. What about seven? That's not eight, that's worker 10. Hey, what about five? That's 10 as well. So you can see in this case, the threads no longer block and wait on your request. Is this an imperative style code we wrote? Absolutely, right? So that's an imperative style code. That's exactly what we wrote. But the imperative style code, is this code synchronous or asynchronous? What's the answer? It depends. Beautiful, he's been paying attention. But he's been saying it depends even yesterday, though, by the way. So that's why I pointed towards him. Thank you. So, so essentially, the answer is it depends. And it depends on what? It depends on 
whether you are doing I.O. or not, and it depends on whether using threads are virtual threads. So what do we learn from this lesson? What we learned in this lesson is from Java 19, okay, more realistically 21, which is in September, right, which is the LTS version. This is in preview right now, but it's gonna be real stuff in a couple of months, a few months. So from Java 21, the structure of imperative style, I'm gonna move this up here. So the structure of imperative style uh, uh, synchronous code is the same uh, as the structure of imperative style, uh, style, you could say asynchronous, if you will, code, and of course, why? Thanks to Project Loom. And, and this is the beautiful world we are heading in. Hope that was useful. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.